We read 1 Kings chapter 3, beginning in verse 4. This is God's word, eternally true. The king went to Gibeon to offer sacrifices, for that was the most important high place. And Solomon offered a thousand burnt offerings on that altar. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon during the night in a dream, and God said, Ask for whatever you want me to give to you. Solomon answered, You have shown great kindness to your servant, my father David, because he was faithful to you and righteous and upright in heart. You have continued this great kindness to him and have given him a son to sit on his throne this very day. Now, O Lord, my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father David, but I am only a little child and do not know how to carry out my duties. Your servant is here among the people you have chosen, a great people, too numerous to count or number. So give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people and to distinguish between right and wrong. For who is able to govern this great people of yours? The Lord was pleased that Solomon had asked for this. So God said to him, since you have asked for this and not for long life or wealth for yourself, nor have you asked for the death of your enemies, but for discernment in administering justice. I will do what you have asked. I will give you a wise and discerning heart so that there will never have been anyone like you, nor will there ever be. Moreover, I will give you what you have not asked for, both riches and honor so that in your lifetime you will have no equal among kings. And if you walk in my ways and obey my statutes and commands, as David your father did, I will give you a long life. Then Solomon awoke, and he realized that it had been a dream. He returned to Jerusalem, stood before the Ark of the Lord's Covenant, and sacrificed burnt offerings and fellowship offerings. Then he gave a feast for all his court. Here ends our reading. Uh, This is God's word, eternally true. Um, As you see in your bulletin here, there's a response to this reading, the word of the Lord. Thanks indeed. Let's pray. Uh, Some people, when they get into hardship, and certainly all of us have hardship all throughout our lives. That's what our lives consist of, various hardships, things that are difficult for us. And and sometimes there are hardships that don't bother us too much, and sometimes there are hardships that, that are really important to us and that are very, very legitimately difficult for us. But sometimes out in the world, people say, well, where is God? And they even you know, accuse God of not existing, right? If God were, if he were God, uh, then he would take care of this, and evil wouldn't exist in the world, or as Homer Simpson said, God, if you are God, you will get me tickets to that game. You can laugh, that's okay. That's the way most people are. They don't want anything to do with God, but when they want something, then God owes them something. But we understand more than that, and Scripture presents more than that, and it presents that God's people get the great blessing of God's presence. Now, God is omnipresent, which means he's everywhere, and he sustains all things, and Jesus is keeping all things together by his powerful word, we read in Hebrews and Colossians. Uh, But God can be present in different ways. Sometimes God visits, and when he says, I will visit you to his people, that's not a good thing, because he's going to visit in judgment. But sometimes God visits to his people in blessing. And we're going to talk about, as Kings is dealing with all throughout First and Second Kings, when is it that God shows up in blessing? And when is it that God shows up or, or is present in judgment? And the people reading First and Second Kings were in judgment. They were reading this in Babylon. They were reading this in exile. And they were understandably evaluating, if they were thinking about such things, they were evaluating, why are we in exile? What happened? 
Why did God visit us in judgment through Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and destroy Jerusalem, destroy the temple, and carry us off into a land that was not our inheritance? So our, if you'd like to fill blanks in an outline, you can begin that now. God with his, with his people uh, by his blessing presence. Okay, and that's God's desire. That's God's uh, always his uh, inclination toward his people. He wants just to bless us, and he's gracious to us even in our sins so that he can just bless us, and as David says, and not treat us as our sins deserve, and he can do that because the blood of Jesus has covered our transgression. But God is with his people in his blessing presence. Scripture gives us a picture of being away from his blessing presence in this exile. Exile in scripture is all through, and we did a Sunday school class on this that lasted months on the idea of exile through scripture. The first exile happens when? Do you remember? Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve are exiled from the place of God's presence where God walked among them in the garden. They're exiled. They're cut out, and, and there's a, a gate to the garden, and God guards his guarding angels, or cherubim, and he guards the, the gate with cherubim with a flaming sword so that, and God says, they may not re-enter the Garden of Eden, take from the tree of life, and live forever. And so Adam and Eve, uh, shortly after, we don't know how long, are exiled. But there's exile all through Scripture, and there's exile into eternity. And the question is, how do we maintain uh, the presence of God in blessing uh, upon us and why is that the case that God can bless a sinful people like us we all sin there are three kinds of exile which of which the New Testament speaks it's not just an Old Testament idea so that's your next line there in your outline the first kind of exile that the New Testament speaks of is being outside the church today the church is set up as the promised land of today so if you were in Old Testament Israel all your neighbors, if you ask them, who's your God? They said, Yahweh, the, the, the God of heaven, the one who created the, the heavens and the earth, the God of the Old Testament, although they wouldn't have said Old Testament because they didn't know there was a new coming. Uh, but, but all your neighbors, there was no dispute in the promised land as to who was God as, as God's people were, were living there. They were all descendants of Abraham. Now, you know, they, they became unfaithful, but in general, that was the case. And where is that today? That's in the church. Right now, as you sit here or, or are watching from home um, with people around you, there's no dispute who, who the one true God is, who the creator of the heavens and the earth is, who your hope should be in. And that's the church today. So if you're outside the church, you're in exile. You're not under God's blessing presence. You're not in the temple of God, which is the church, 1 Corinthians 3.16, where his presence is, where his, his spirit dwells, but you're outside of his presence, excluded from the promises of the gospel. Now, there's an open invitation. The universal call of the gospel goes out to everybody to say, hey, come on in. We talked about that last week with Solomon and his wife. She was Egyptian. We read about that this morning in Psalm 45. In addition to, in those first 11 verses, this is a psalm that's in praise of Solomon, not of Jesus, not of, the, not of God at first. This is God's people, and they're giving praise to Solomon, and they're saying, you're righteous, you judge righteously, and because of that, we have blessing in our land. And then they turn their attention to his new bride coming up from the south, with the gold of Ophir, which is probably somewhere in Arabia, upon her, all dressed for her, from her wedding. And they say, now, leave your father and your people behind and embrace our great, our great king. And so this land, this promised land, was the place where God dwelled among his people in the tabernacle and in the, timber, in the, t the, the temple after that, and he blesses them. But today, that place where God dwells is the church. Second kind of exile that the New Testament speaks of, it's being excluded from heaven when you die. Heaven is the place where God is, 
in his special blessing presence in a fuller sense than even here. Okay, here we have imperfect things like nicks on the table. Okay, uh, but in heaven that's not the case. So there's a, a greater sense of, of being with God and, and is certainly your soul being present with him upon your death in heaven. But if you're not in heaven, if you die apart from faith in Christ, you're in hell and hell is exile. It's being excluded from God's blessing presence and, and, and God is visiting in judgment uh, those in the exile of hell. And you can read about that in, in uh, uh, um, 2 Peter um, chapter, chapter 2, um, Luke 16, um, uh, or a couple of places that deal, that deal with that. Uh, a third kind of exile that the New Testament talks about. So you've got exile when you're living, that is being outside the church. Exile when you die, that's when your soul is excluded from heaven and in hell instead. And then you have the third kind of exile that the New Testament speaks about, and that's when Jesus comes back, and that's being excluded from the new heavens and the new earth. Okay, so, so you know, heaven's where your soul goes if you're a believer in Jesus when you die, and your body stays here, right? The souls of believers are at their death. You know, do rest, your body does rest in its grave till the resurrection. There we go. Uh, and, and, and decomposes. Um, but when Jesus comes back, body and soul come together, and there's bodily resurrection. And uh, Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 15, if there's not bodily resurrection, we're wasting our time here. Our faith is useless if there's not bodily resurrection. And so we're told in Revelation 20 at the great judgment that Jesus raises, he resurrects all bodies of the righteous and the unrighteous. Jesus talks about it as well in John, in John chapter 5, a resurrection of all the dead. And bodies are united with souls, and we stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Those of us who have believed in Christ, to hear our names read from the Lamb's book of life, and to give an account for the good works that we've done and to be rewarded for that. The time will have come, as the book of Revelation says, to be rewarded. Um, but for those who aren't believers, their bodies will be united with their souls and they, they will stand before Jesus and give an account for the acts they've done and the words they've said in those bodies and righteously judged before Jesus and sent into permanent exile in the lake of fire. Body and soul. Hell is dumped into the lake of fire. You know, you know I'm teaching a class on this now, so I'm, all, all this stuff is buzzing in my mind. But you know that dead souls don't stay in hell forever because dead souls are met with their bodies at final judgment, and body and soul, they go into the lake of fire. You will not be in heaven forever. Your soul will be in heaven until Jesus comes back and then your soul and body together, body and soul, because God creates physical stuff, Genesis 1, and calls it good. Body and soul, you will be with Jesus in the new heavens and new earth. But if you're not in the new heavens and new earth, body and soul, at final judgment, when Jesus comes, you're in exile. Excluded from the blessing presence of Jesus, who's come with the heavenly Jerusalem down to earth, in the new Jerusalem, dwelling with him forever on this earth without weeds. Redone, and you can read about that in 2 Peter chapter 3, um, this series. Um, so those are three kinds of exile. So how does this relate to Solomon? Well, Solomon's in that first kind of promised land. And he's creating an environment, we read here in this passage, along with his father David, creating an environment where God's people are experiencing the blessing of God and that God's blessing presence among them. And this was the case for Solomon under his kingship all your life. That's when you wanted to live. If you were in Old Testament Israel, that's when you wanted to live. David had a heart after God all his life, and that was wonderful. But as we preach through in 2 Samuel, he created a lot of trouble for God's people because of his sin with Bathsheba and against Bathsheba's husband. Uriah. And so there's turmoil um, under David, um, e even though he, he's an example of repentance for us. But the, the period of peace is under Solomon. 
and, and, and bad stuff doesn't happen in Israel until Solomon's dead. And so we look at this and see what are the sources of a peace or God's blessing presence among us. So number one in your outline there, for the people of God in Solomon's day, exile didn't happen. Even if you were one of the original readers of First and Second Kings, which was one book, even if you were one of the original readers and you were in Babylon exiled, you could look back at this time and get this glimpse in these first 11 chapters of First Kings how things used to be good. My father lived, or my forefathers lived in the promised land in the blessing of God uh, uh, under this righteous king Solomon. If you know Solomon's end, don't think about that yet. Okay, we're not there. This is Solomon being faithful. This is Solomon giving a thousand burnt offerings unto the Lord. A burnt offering meant I need atonement. This is humble Solomon who says, how many burnt offerings can I give to the Lord? Is a thousand enough? And, and he goes to Gibeon, and, and Gibeon was a high place, yes, but it's where the tabernacle was. He goes to the tabernacle. It's where the bronze altar was of offering. And so he appropriately gives these offerings there in Gibeon where the tabernacle was. And then when he's even done with that, when he comes back to Jerusalem, that's where David had brought the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant was separated from the tabernacle at this time, and David had pitched a tent in Jerusalem for the Ark of the Covenant. Solomon comes back, and he sacrifices all these other burnt offerings and fellowship offerings. So this is faithful Solomon we're looking at here. So in Solomon's day, exile didn't happen because of King Solomon's faithful, that's your blank, faithful character and actions. And we see this listed for us in verses 4 through 15. And this includes kind of a spillover from David, but also true with Solomon. So how is Solomon uh, inheriting and following in the ways of his father David? How is he faithful? Okay, ready for a lot of blanks? Okay, here you go. This used to be a long list, and, and the bulletin was like I needed a whole, nother, a whole, whole other page. I'm getting out of that habit of saying whole nother. I think it means whole another with an apostrophe there, but you're not supposed to say it. Whole other uh, list. So I, I just comp I compacted it into A and B. We're told here he does not pursue riches. God commends him for that in verse 11 and verse 13. Okay, he's asked, I'll give you whatever you want. He doesn't pursue riches. He doesn't ask for riches. He doesn't pursue honor. And he's commended for that in verse 12. In verse 13, and God says, well, I'm going to give you honor because I'm so pleased with you that you don't care about honor. He doesn't pursue revenge or violence or the, the undoing, the destruction of his enemies. Now, we've just read, you may say, what? Because you, we've just read in chapter 2 that David carried out his father's commands to him concerning certain individuals in his kingdom. People like Adonijah and, and, and such, but but what he does is justice. Um, and, and David does just, or sorry, Solomon does justice in chapter two. Uh, and he, he follows his father's way and he acts justly. And no point in that is, is this idea of revenge against his personal enemies, but, but walking in the ways that will preserve God's people. And so that's that scene in verse 11. And God says, way to go, Solomon. You're, you care about me, you care about my people, and not about revenge against your enemies. And then B, here are all these things that, that Solomon did not lack care. I put this in the negative uh, for us. He did not lack care for God's people. When he's asked, what, Solomon, I'll give you anything, he talks about God's people and his care for them. What was his concern? And, and verses 8 and 9, this is a great people, he says there. See that? Too numerous. You've blessed us. You promised that Abraham would be a great nation. But now look at us. Look at all these people here. And this is a great nation, and I'm a little child. I don't know how to administer these people. I don't have the wisdom to do this, to carry out justice for them. And, Lord, these are your people. So that's what Solomon cares about. He cares about them. He cares about being a good king for for their sake. And we even see at the very end of this passage, what's he do when he comes back to Jerusalem? He offers more sacrifices, and then he throws a feast for God's people. He says, hey, come on, let's celebrate. Okay, my father David put us at peace. Everyone's afraid of us. Um, 
uh, the, 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 the king of Egypt, Pharaoh, has given his daughter to me in marriage so that because he's afraid of us too. He's just suing for peace and we've granted it for him so we don't have to worry about Egypt marching in against us. And, and, and that's all our southern front is, is, is all at peace. So let's celebrate and he gives them, he gives them a feast. Um, by the way, just think forward. What does Jesus do when he comes back? He gives his people a feast, the wedding supper of the lamb. There's rejoicing. We've just gone through a period of trouble, and our peace is secured in the new heavens and new earth. And that new heavens and new earth for us begins with the wedding supper of the Lamb, where we feast with our king, who's just defeated all threats to our peace. And so that's what Solomon is. So David has done, and then Solomon follows up with all threats to lack of peace in the kingdom he's taken care of in chapter 2. And so he cares for God's people, um, not just for, not, it's not his own revenge, and he gives his people a feast there. He does not lack care, uh, he does not lack faithfulness, verse 6. Um, what's he do um, here in verse 6? He goes and he says, you, you've shown your kindness to your servant, you've continued this kindness to me, I've given him a son to sit on his throne. Um, this is David being faithful, this is Solomon being faithful. Third thing, righteousness. That's being faithful to the covenant. And so Solomon was faithful to, you know, there was this covenant with, with Moses, and that gave us the law. And Solomon's faithful to pursue the law. But Solomon's also is faithful to the covenant with David. And part of being faithful to the covenant with David is he would take up the kingship, and he would do the things necessary to be a good administrator and king over the people. And so Solomon begins in this, in faithfulness. Next thing, also in verse 6, this righteous, righteousness, faithfulness, righteousness, and then verse 6, an upright heart. David had this, and Solomon began this. His heart's upright. He's not in the kingship saying, what can I get out of it? He, he communicates to the Lord, God, these are your people. You're, um, you've been kind to my father David. He was just a shepherd, and you made him king over all his people. Then you made him promises that that the kingship would always be to his sons. Um, and, and then uh, in, in addition to this, uh, now you're being kind to me. And, and out of all David's sons, and there were a lot, you've chosen me. Um, and, and so David, or so Solomon looks with an upright heart to the Lord and says, so since you've made me the king, how can I be the kind of king that I need to be for the sake of your people? This is, this is a, a king with an upright heart. Um, moving on to verses 9, 11, 12, and 14, he has a concern for following God's commands. Uh, so that's your blank, a concern for following God's commands, which Solomon identifies in the book of Proverbs and Ecclesiastes as being equal to wisdom. Wisdom and a concern for knowing and following God's commands are the same thing. Okay, it's just, it's that simple. Okay, wisdom, and so, so that's what Solomon is, is looking for, wisdom. He's following God's commands. He's obeying him in, in the sacrificial uh, stuff as well as walking in his ways. You see that in verses 9, 11, 12, and 14. Humility, you see this in verses 7 and 15. He doesn't rise up like Nebuchadnezzar and say, all these kingdoms of the earth, Nebuchadnezzar says in chapter 2 of Daniel, belong to me because of my greatness. He says, no, I'm king because you, Lord, have been kind to me. He's humble. He admits that he needs atonement. He gives all these burnt offerings uh, to the Lord. He calls himself a little child in need of guidance. Hold my hand, God, so I know when to cross the street. Humility. And then verse 7 is, uh, well, dependence upon the Lord. Looking to the Lord as a child looks to his father. Back to verse 6, thankfulness to God for this kingdom that God had given to him. And then lastly, verses 4 and 15, uh, 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 he doesn't lack a commitment to worship. And certainly we see that with all the offerings that Solomon makes to worship the Lord. So why were things good in Solomon's kingdom? Because Solomon had all these characteristics. 
If you look in Deuteronomy 17, which is where Moses prescribes how the king of Israel was supposed to be, for all these good qualities, Solomon fits those. If we look at uh, 2 Samuel 7, where David is promised the kingdom to his sons forever, uh, we see Solomon fits these. But as we looked uh, as we looked this morning in the passages we were reading, we could see in Psalm 45, they understood this. We will be blessed as long as our king is faithful. So the most important thing you can have about you is having a faithful king if you're in Israel. Remember that language that we read or, or in our call to worship this morning, Psalm 72, was also about the king, about Solomon. It's David writing and Solomon is taking the throne. And it's like, because you are righteous, because you are just, because you protect the poor, the trodden on, because you lift them up, our mountains are bursting with produce. We're getting rain when we're supposed to get rain. We have peace in the land because you, our king Solomon, are a righteous king. That's how God deals with his people. That's how they can expect blessing, God's blessing presence in the land, even though they were all sinners. They could expect God's blessing presence because they had a righteous king. And you'll see that as we go through First, first Kings through the rest of it. When a king is righteous, God shows up in his blessing presence and he blesses the people. And if a king is evil and then turns and repents and turns to the Lord, God immediately blesses the people. The people's well-being is dependent on the faithfulness of the king. That's what we see through scripture. And so we see that here as well. God's promise to David, uh, uh, God's promise to David, number two, was that the righteousness of the king, the righteousness of the king would keep his people safe or out of exile. Uh, we saw this in chapter 2, verse 4. This is certainly the promise there in 2 Samuel 7, and as I mentioned in these uh, Psalm 72 and Psalm 70 as we looked at them uh, this morning. Solomon's righteousness kept the people out of exile. Now, number three. Later, later unfaithful kings in Israel, however, would earn for God's people exile. And that's what we'll see. Uh, starting in chapter 12 in 1 Kings. And that goes on all the way through 2 Kings. 2 Kings 25, that's the last chapter of 2 Kings. Until the people are finally exiled and they're all in Babylon, what we see is that later unfaithful kings bring division, and chaos, and exile eventually as the final uh, uh, covenant curse upon them. But now, number four, to Jesus. To Jesus. Uh, this is where we rejoice and we make the connections that we're supposed to make with Solomon. Jesus as son of David and king. Okay, so Solomon, son of David. Jesus is son of David. As we see in the Gospels, people call him son of David. Or as Matthew and Luke show that Jesus genealogically is descended uh, from David. Jesus as son of David and king has perfect righteousness. He has a righteousness that's beyond David's and beyond, beyond Solomon's that blessed the kingdom. So Jesus has a perfect righteousness and thus keeps, that's your word, keeps his elect people out of exile. He keeps his elect people out of exile. So to prevent our, so uh, Jesus says these statements in John uh, chapter 6. And this is the will of him who sent me, the will of my father, this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all he has given me, that is the elect, those the Father gave Jesus. I shall lose none of those he has given me, but raise them up on the last day. Jesus, the righteous one, will keep his people, the one that the Father has given him, out of eternal exile. When I come back, I will raise them up on the last day. Or chapter, chapter 6 in John, verse 54. He says, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood, which is a symbol for believing in him, which he explains there. Whoever believes in him has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day into eternal life, not eternal death. So Jesus, our righteous king, 
son of David guarantees or secures the eternal life, the not being in exile for all those the Father has given him. So this is a good thing. How does Jesus do this? Well, Jesus does this by walking in the ways of Solomon. We can read down this whole passage and say, okay, Solomon checks all these boxes, and Jesus checks them exponentially in a greater way. Jesus, ultimate son of David, checks these boxes to guarantee and secure that there's peace in the land, peace in the church, peace for those who he raises at death to heaven, and peace eternally for those he, who he raises to be with him in the new heavens and new earth. So A in your outline, to re- prevent our exile, Jesus, so Solomon didn't care about riches, remember? He didn't ask for riches. So what about Jesus? To prevent our exile, Jesus left riches in heaven. It was your, your uh, declaration of the gospel this morning. Look at that. Uh, second second uh, uh, Corinthians 8, 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus. Lord is king. Okay, that means that's what you call your king. You call your king Lord. Okay, you know the grace of our king, Jesus, the anointed one, the Christ, the one anointed to be king, our Lord, our king. You know his grace that though he was rich, eternally existing in heaven with no beginning, with everything he needed, suffering no want, Though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor. That speaks to his incarnation. He enters into the womb of the Virgin Mary. He lives life and he experiences hunger. He has to say, I, I'm hungry. Um, I, I'm thirsty. Um, we don't know if he skinned his knee. Maybe. He did. But all the stuff of life that we go through that's uh, not stuff of honor and glory, he goes through. For our sakes he became poor so that through his poverty, through his coming to this earth, dying on a cross with underwear to his name, we become rich. Spiritually rich. And eventually in the new heavens and new earth, materially rich. Having everything physically we need. So to prevent our exile, Jesus left riches in heaven. B, to prevent our exile, Jesus pursued not honor. And Solomon's commended for this. You've not pursued honor, but you just care about my people. But God said, I'll, I'll give honor to you. But Jesus doesn't pursue honor, but he pursues scorn. He pursues scorn. He comes not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom uh, for many. So Hebrews 12, 2, it says, Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, for the joy set before him, endured the cross, scorning its shame. Okay, so he endures scorn and shame and mocking. Matthew 27, 29, and then they twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on his head. King Sping, right? He said They set it on his head. They put a staff in his right hand. Get this? They're mocking him. They put a staff in his right hand and knelt in front of him and mocked him and said, Hail, King of the Jews. Jesus knew this would happen, and he came. Because he didn't pursue honor. He pursued being mocked and scorned because that's what we deserved. Right? If we proclaimed ourselves as king, we we would deserve that. For people to put a crown of thorns on our head and to put a a kingly staff and and bow down before us with a robe they they put around us because we were so beaten they could just do that and we couldn't couldn't shake it off. And and to bow mockingly and say, Hail, King of the Jews, in all their power and their Roman armor that was upon them. So Jesus pursued not like Solomon. He doesn't pursue honor. He pursues mocking and shame and scorn. C, to prevent our exile, Jesus pursued not revenge against the Pharisees or against us who were in rebellion against him all our lives, as the gospels or as the epistles say of us, Ephesians 2, verses 1 and 2, uh, Philippians 1, verses 21, says we are alienated and hostile 
in mind toward him. He didn't pursue revenge against us. He didn't even pursue revenge against those who put him on the cross. Remember what he says in the cross. Father, forgive them, for they know they don't understand spiritually what they're doing. They don't know what they do. Father, forgive them. So Jesus pursued not revenge against the Pharisees' arrest, but here's your blank, grace. Grace. He pursued favor toward his enemies. Next, D, to prevent our exile, Jesus showed his care for God's people, as he spoke in John 6, for those the Father has given me. So the Father elects, but Jesus cares for those whom the Father elects, for those the Father has written their names on his book of life. Uh, but, but those names need to be bought, and he buys those names, us, with his blood, Revelation 5, right? No one's worthy to open the, the scroll, the book of life, no one's worthy to open that because no one's bought it. No one's bought those people. And the price for those people is sinless blood. And so all of heaven already there at the time John writes Revelation say, worthy is he to take the scroll and to open its seals. For with his, with his blood he has purchased men for God. Okay, so, so Jesus comes to do this. He shows his care. That's why he comes. That's why he comes to be king. Not for, not for glory he comes, but he, but he comes because he cares for us. And, and there's, there's a book of life, but it has seals that no one is worthy to open. And so at final judgment, no one can read those names. And he cares about us. So he says, I've got to get this book of life open and break these seals. But I can't break these seals until I can pay for the book of life. This is all Revelation 5 stuff. I can pay for the book of life. And that seal, that book can be handed to me. And I can break the seals of that book. By the way, a, scroll, a book in Old Testament times was a scroll. You didn't have bound books. You know, like, where is it? There it is. You didn't have bond. You know, what we think book is this. But a book, you know prior to like printing press and that kind of thing. A book is, is on scrolls, everything was. So the scroll that Jesus takes that has seven seals is the same thing as the book of, book of life there. So that was free. Um, but Jesus comes, he cares for God's people, and how does he care for us? By taking our punishment. By taking our punishment, by bleeding for us, by purchasing us. Um, and uh, he does this, so he, he comes, takes our punishment, and he also today, in wisdom, governs us. That's your second blank there. So Jesus showed his care for God's people, first blank, by taking our punishment and by governing us today in wisdom by his word and spirit. So as Isaiah put about the Davidic king who would rule after the exile, uh, he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace that punishment was upon him. Jesus cares for his people, just like Solomon did. Solomon said, God, these are your people. I, I need to govern them right, rightly and give them justice and make sure they're blessed. That's Solomon's care, not for his own wealth, not for his own honor. And so he cares for them and says, give me wisdom. And Jesus, with all wisdom, sees what our need is. In his care for us, he dies for us. And then, even now, he continu continues to govern us, to show us how to live so we don't mess up our lives. So, uh, and so he gives us his word and guides us along in there. Uh, e, to prevent our exile, Jesus was faithful to his father, uh, his father's order to atone for our sins. And he went to the cross. Uh, so Matthew 26, 39, going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and he prayed, my father, Jesus prayed, my father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Jesus is faithful to his father. We see here, it's the father's plan, the father's will, that he will save a people for his son, but he will do it through the death of his son through the atoning death of his son. And so even though Jesus scorned the shame of the cross, he said, Father, not my will, but your will be done. I will be faithful, Father, to your will 
And because Jesus was faithful to the Father's will, he went to the cross, and we get the blessing presence of God in our lives and for eternity. E, to prevent our, uh, sorry, uh, F, to prevent our exile, Jesus was perfectly righteous. That is, he is faithful to to the covenant. He obeyed the law of the covenant through Moses. So he obeyed the moral law of God. He obeyed the ceremonial law of God while he lived. Uh, He was doing everything. He did not sin, 1 Peter 2.22. He did not sin because for our sins to be forgiven, there needed to be a perfect sacrifice, a lamb without blemish that was offered, and a sin was a blemish. And so Jesus is perfectly righteous. He's perfectly faithful to the covenant. And and he goes sinlessly, sinlessly to the cross, obeying the law of the covenant through Moses. But he also obeys, he's also righteous to the Davidic covenant too. God had covenanted with David that not only would David be king over all God's people, but David's son would be king over all God's people. And then David's son's descendants too. And Solomon is faithful to take this up. When God's people come back from exile originally in 538 BC, Zerubbabel was the son of David, but he wasn't faithful to take up the kingship. Nobody was, and so there was no king uh, until Jesus comes along. But Solomon is faithful to the covenant with Moses. He's faithful to the covenant with David as well. And so Jesus takes up the kingship, and from the get-go, after his baptism, after going those 40 days into the wilderness, his first message is this. The message he knows will get him crucified are the Pharisees and Sadducees who are the present ruler of, rulers of God's people as a group. He starts from the get-go getting them mad at him, <laughs> taking up his role as Davidic king. And he says in Mark 1, 15, see, early on, the time has come, the kingdom of God is near, repent and believe the good news. And to the end of his life, Pilate asks him, are you a king then, Matthew 15, 2? And Jesus says, again, taking up his role as king, the land that, the, the role that will earn him the, the uh, crime of treason against Caesar. This is Caesar's lackey, Pilate saying, are you a king then? And Jesus says, I am. So Jesus takes up his role as king for us, even though it will get the the Jewish leadership to put him on a cross. And he takes up his kingship in front of Pilate as well. He doesn't hide from it, knowing that this can be the charge. Pilate doesn't give a rip about Jewish law, right? And he tells the Pharisees, Why have you brought this guy to me? He hasn't done any wrong. But then he asked him, are you a king? And this Pilate could really, he could crucify Jesus for treason against King Caesar. And Jesus says, yes, I am. Yes, I am a king. And so Jesus dies and his crimes are printed above his head in three languages. King of the Jews. Jesus takes up his kingship because he needs to be faithful to you, to his Father, so that God's blessing presence can be upon you. God's blessing presence can only, it's only upon us today because Jesus went to the cross, and he only went to the cross because he was king, king. Now next, um, G, to prevent our exile, Jesus, in following his father's directive to die, did not did so not with complaint, but with an upright heart. And you see this in Jesus' attitude. He says, I come not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. This is, Jesus is not like, oh, come on, Father, I don't want to do this. Really? For real? You know, as we say now, you know, he's always willing. He's always willing. If there's some other way, great, but if not, I'll do it. He has an upright heart uh, before his father. Now, H, to prevent our exile, Jesus followed and taught God's commands. So Solomon was doing this, and his, he was following God's commands. Uh, and we, we read about that in, in 1 Kings 3. But Jesus follows God's commands, and he teaches them. Uh, so we see this in John 4, 34 and 6, 38. Uh, but Matthew 5 through 7 is Jesus teaching God's commands, totally committed to them. I, to prevent our exile, 
You know, if the king wasn't committed to God's commands, God's people would go into exile. So Jesus is committed to God's commands and does them. I, to prevent our exile, Jesus taking human flesh and is being beaten, mocked, and hung on a cross shows us the humility, the humility he took on. Indeed, this is a characteristic of Solomon. We see him, Solomon, calling himself a little child. I don't have wisdom. I'm only here because you've been kind to my father. And I'm only here because I'm my father's son, and I didn't do anything for that either. And you could have picked Adonijah or, or one of my other brothers, uh, but you picked me. Um, so we see that humility with Solomon, but we see it with Jesus indeed. Um, you know, there's Matthew 11:29. 29. Uh, Jesus says about himself, for I am gentle and humble in heart. We have a king who's humble before the father. Um, Luke 18, 32, uh, he will be handed over to the Gentiles. They will mock him, insult him, spit on him, flog him, and kill him. Um, Luke 22, 63, the men were guarding Jesus, and they began mocking and beating him. Luke 23, 11, then Herod and his soldiers ridiculed and mocked Jesus, dressing him in an elegant robe. They sent him back to Pilate. And then finally, as Jesus is about to take his last breath, Luke 23, 36, as he hung on the cross, the soldiers also came up and mocked him, and they offered him wine vinegar. Here, drink this. You thirsty? <laughs> Have some wine vinegar. That'll help. Um, but Jesus has great humility. He knows this is going to happen, and he goes through it uh, for us because he cares for us. Um, J, to prevent our exile, Jesus was dependent on God, his Father. He was dependent on God, his Father, both for two things, both for placing the placing of our sins upon him on the cross and for his overcoming death. So we read from 2 Corinthians 5.21, he who knew no sin, that is Jesus, the one who knew no sin, was made sin by God the Father, that we might become the righteousness of God being in Christ. And so Jesus is made sin there on the cross, or as Peter puts it in 1 Peter 2.24, he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross. So Jesus is dependent on God to do that. You know, that's a supernatural occurrence, that the sins of all God's people, the Old Testament, and all God's people during Jesus' day, and all God's people until the day Jesus comes back, that all their sins would be placed on Jesus' body on the cross. So Jesus was dependent to die for something. That is, death wouldn't just be him dying. He needed the Father to turn away from him, to place our sins upon him on the cross, so that he would be dying for us, and not just dying because people didn't like him so he's dependent in that way but he's also dependent on the father to overcome death so we talked about this morning what's a king do in israel he protects his people he saves his people from death and so what's G what's david do he's just been anointed as king in first samuel 16 solomon arrives in bethlehem david's out tending the sheep solomon uh, Sam samson Sorry, Samson's his name. Samuel. There we go, right S. Samuel arrives in Bethlehem, and he anoints David as king, chapter 16. And in chapter 17, who knows what's in chapter 17? Goliath. And what's the newly anointed king do? He sees that all God's people are threatened with death by the Philistine army. And they're all shaking in their boots. And, and, and gladly... One man has come out and said, let's not waste all this bloodshed. Let's just settle it between me and somebody. Somebody come out and fight me. So that's Goliath. And David says, I'll do it. That's what a king does. He goes before the people, out in front of them, and he fights their battle for them. And, and, and Goliath says, and if your champion defeats me, we, the Philistines, will be your slaves. No, they don't, and they don't carry their end of the bargain. <laughs> after David defeats Goliath. But what's a king do for you? He goes out before you and he defeats your enemy. Why do you want a king? Why were people wanting there to be a Messiah, a Christ, a king when Jesus comes? Why is it good news 
that a king was, that a kingdom was now at hand because Jesus, the son of David, was there because the king fights your enemies and he defeats them for you so you can be safe in your homes. And that's what's going on. That's what's going on with Jesus. Um, he goes out um, and he overcomes death. When he goes to Jerusalem, it's not to be crowned as king. When he goes to Jerusalem, it's to overcome death. And he tells his disciples that over and over again. He says, we will go to Jerusalem. We're going there. And when we go there, I will be, and I read it earlier, I'll be turned, I'll be mocked. I'll be unjustly tried. I'll be turned over to the Gentiles, to the Romans, and I will be crucified. But then, on the third day, I will rise from the dead. See, it's always Jesus' objective. He wasn't surprised in his last week of life. He goes to to die and to overcome death so that we in him would overcome death as well. When the king wins the battle, all the citizens of the kingdom win the battle too, even though they weren't fighting it. And you and I all have a battle in front of us, and that's our death. We're mortal. And Jesus went before us, and he fought death, and he overcame it. But he doesn't overcome it by himself. He overcomes it by his father. He's dependent on his father, just like Solomon. God, I need your wisdom, Solomon says. I need you. I need your power, your wisdom to govern this people. And Jesus on the cross was one of the other things he says, showing his dependence on the father. Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. Do with me as you will. And so the father raises him on the third day. This is kingly dependence on God the Father above. Jesus does this to win the battle for us. And so just as David had done before, why did David know he would win? Because God was with him, and God had given him victory over a lion and a bear. And he knew, going against Goliath, that God's name had been taunted and thrown out there to be trampled. And so that God would win the victory, and he didn't need a sword, and he didn't need Saul's armor to do it. God would win it because God was fighting the battle. And Jesus, as the, the, the descendant of David, also says, I will win this battle over death because God my Father is with me, and he will raise me from the dead by his spirit of power, which will also raise my people, Romans uh, 8, 9. So Jesus is dependent on God's placing our sins, so the Father's placing our sins upon him, and he's dependent on the Father to raise him from death. If you're dead, you can't do anything. So you're in a position of total dependence, and Jesus was in that position. And then to present, prevent our exile, Jesus was thankful to his Father for giving him the kingship over the people. We read that the Father gives the kingship to the Son, uh, people for the Son, in Psalm 2, uh, we also saw that in, in uh, Zechariah's words, Zechariah and uh, Luke chapter 1 this morning. That's John the Baptist's dad, and he speaks about John the, his son's role would be to pave the way for the king. Uh, and, and that the king would save his people. That's what Zechariah says. God, you're giving us a king again. My son will go before him and prepare, prepare the way for him, for Jesus. But Jesus will save his people. And so Jesus does that for us, and he's thankful for this people that God has given to him to save. And so Jesus says in his prayer before his being, uh, before his being carried off by the temple guard, I pray for them, my people. I'm not praying for the world, but for those, Father, you have given me, for they're yours. No pride in this, just thankfulness to, of Jesus for this. And then L, to prevent our exile, Jesus offered his body as a sacrifice for our sins as his great act of worship. Um, Hebrews 10, verses 4 through 7. Listen to this. So Solomon offers all these offerings um, as representative of God's people so that their sins would be atoned for. That's what's going on in this passage here. All, giving these offerings so their sins would be uh, atoned for. Uh, and so Sol But Solomon goes away living. <laughs> he doesn't offer his own body. He offers the body of these bulls and goats and so forth. Um, 
But listen to what Jesus as king has to do. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 4 through 7. Because it is impossible for, blood, for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. In other words, human beings and bulls aren't the same. <laughs> it's not a, the, a, an adequate substitute. Right? An ant is not an adequate substitute for you. Okay? A bull is not an adequate substitute for you. you. You bear the image of God. A bull does not. A, go a goat does not. And so Hebrews uh, 12, 12, 4 or 10, 4 here, because it is impossible for the blood and goats to take away sins, when Christ came into the world, he said, Jesus said, sacrifice an offering of more bulls and goats you do not desire, my Father, but a body you gave to me. This body of flesh is what you gave to me to offer as a sacrifice. Unlike Solomon, who offered bulls and goats, a body you've prepared for me, a body you've given to me, because the blood of bulls and goats cannot cover, cannot, cannot cover sins or take them away. Then Jesus said, verse 7, then he said, here I am, I have come to do your will, O God. And he offered his own body as a pleasing sacrifice to God for our sins. So Solomon, great worshiper, great achiever of atonement by offering blood, the blood of bulls and goats to God. But Jesus comes and he offers an adequate sacrifice himself, fully human, as well as being fully God. And he enters, we read in the book of Hebrews as well, not with the blood of bulls and goats into the heavenly tabernacle, but with his own blood. Having offered perfect worship unto God, he breaks the, the, the curtain of the tabernacle, the temple, into two so that we have entrance by his blood, not by the blood of bulls and goats as Solomon had done. Adequate for the time, adequate for Solomon's time, but not truly adequate. Just the credit that God gave. It's just a credit card that Solomon put down until Jesus could come through with the real, with the real money of sacrifice. So Jesus guarantees the well-being, the, the, the uh, blessing presence of, of God as Solomon had done with sacrifice so that God's wrath would be expended on all these sacrifices. God's wrath is expended against your sins and the wrath your sins and my sins have deserved because God expended all his wrath against all our sins upon Jesus' body, which Jesus offered up in sacrifice as our great king, as well as being our priest and sacrifice. So, number five, what do we do? Rejoice. Rejoice over your great son of David, who's greater than Solomon. Rejoice over your great son of David, as, ex ex as eternal exile is something, through his character, described here in A through L, however many that is, about 12, yeah, 12 uh, um, there, um, things that we've discussed. How great of a king is Jesus for us? We've just described for you 12 ways, and they don't even cover it all. And there are 12 ways, and each of them are greater than the 12 things that were true of Solomon. So we rejoice. We've got a greater king, and external exile is something through his character and his actions, Jesus' character and actions, has been taken off taken off the table for all his citizens. Hebrews 10, 18, and where, they, and where these sins have been forgiven, there is no longer any sacrifice for sin. Therefore, brothers, we have confidence to enter the most holy place in heaven through the blood of Jesus. Exile in heaven from heaven, exile from the new heavens and new earth has been taken off the table by the blood of Jesus who's made the way for us, our great king. So the question is, and we'll discuss this next week, it's next week's sermon, how do you know if exile is off the table for you? Uh, that can be, you know, we, we talked about yesterday in our officer's training, is assurance of salvation uh, essential to your faith. That is, if you're not quite sure if you have really believed, 
uh, does that cancel out your salvation? How do those things work? What can give you assurance that you're indeed one of those Jesus has died for? We'll talk about that next week. So summary, summary for you. Rejoice that Jesus' righteousness, rejoice that Jesus' righteousness has secured, has secured the elimination of eternal exile, hell, the lake of fire, for all the citizens of his kingdom. Solomon assured that exile wouldn't happen to the people of his day by his own righteousness in all these various ways. Jesus has done that eternally for those who are his people, citizens in his kingdom. Let's pray.